wanted to welcome everybody uh, back to our afternoon session, which is going to focus on different types of water that we all use and deal with um, in our daily lives. And those types of water would be storm water, drinking water, wastewater, and recreational water. So hopefully, uh, have a chance to enjoy recreational water together on a daily basis. At least you maybe get to look at them if you look around here in South Nation or Massachusetts. Um, just a couple of very quick announcements. Um, if you are going to leave at any point, please make sure you leave your name bag behind. Don't forget to get your souvenir mugs. Um, I encourage you to take a look at some of the raffle items that we have so you can get excited and decide what you might want to win, if you win. Um, and those are pretty much our after lunch announcements. So um, I'd like to introduce Ian Cook, who is the Executive Director of the Neponset River Watershed Association, and he's going to be moderating our stormwater panel. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, stormwater is everybody's favorite kind of those three water. Um, my name is Ian Cook. I am uh, executive director of the Ponset River Watershed Association, which might arguably form the extreme northern boundary of southeast Massachusetts. Um, uh, nights and weekends, I also uh, spend time uh, as the board president of the Massachusetts Rivers Alliance. Um, and our organization uh, has stormwater uh, very near and near to its heart. Um, our, our watershed has a lot of impervious surface. Like pretty much everywhere, stormwater is now our um, largest single source of remaining water pollution. And we've been spending a lot of time in the last few years um, working with our towns, working with volunteer water testers, building demonstration DMPs, trying to get communities to work together, trying to do public education around this issue. Um, and we're very lucky to have with us today a uh, esteemed group of panelists. Um, we have Debbie Cook, manager of the uh, Greenscapes program, Martin Pillsbury, uh, director of environmental services from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and uh, Newton Tedder, who is the uh, principal stormwater permit writer for uh, EPA Region 1. And um, I think the, the appeal of our session here is going to be um, having looking at a few different questions from the multiple perspectives that are represented here. We have sort of a government point of view, a regional perspective, a nonprofit point of view, and hopefully also drawing in some, some comments and feedback from the audience as well. Um, so to start things off, um, I have a series of questions that we're going to ask to all the panelists. The same question that, uh, that we can respond to and hopefully get some conversation going on about, and then we also will have some time at the end to, um, for whatever questions you folks have. And our first, well, the first question, which I didn't warn these guys was coming, but I know everybody wants to know, this is actually a question for new. So when is the final Demis for Vermit actually coming out? Um, one year, plus or minus two years. <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way. Um, you know, I, I would make an observation, you know, we spend lots of time working with um, clean water advocates, but also working with municipalities, and it's a very interesting time in the world of stormwater. Uh, for some people it's an exciting time because we may be poised to make some real progress in the stormwater area. For other people it can be, frankly, a bit of an intimidating time if you're the one who's going to be expected to make that progress and you don't have the resources to do it at the moment. Um, but uh, uh, the first question I wanted to ask the, the, uh, our panelists is there's been a lot of discussion about a stormwater, a lot of discussion about um, the draft MS4 permit, and I wonder what you think are some of the, um, the sleeper issues of stormwater management. You know, maybe the things that haven't gotten a lot of discussion uh, or haven't been big, uh, the big focus or big contentious issues of some of the debates that have gone on but that have the potential to, um, to make a real difference in terms of um, uh, improving our water quality or, or in terms of being challenges that uh, perhaps communities and, and uh, local groups need to think more about than they have so far. 
And I don't know who wants to be brave enough to go first, but I'll leave it to you guys. Okay. And actually, you know what? I completely forgot. There's a whole section of the program that I totally forgot about, which is you guys are supposed to introduce yourselves. Yeah. So why don't we do that first? And then you can go. Yeah, why don't you go first? Okay. Hi, folks. My name is Martin Pillsbury. I'm the Director of Environmental Planning here at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which covers a few communities to the south of Boston, but not this entire southeastern Mass area. By a long shot, I know you have the old Colony Planning Council in some of these communities, and Southeastern and the Serpent, and the short Indian, and the rest of it, and the Cape. I guess you consider the Cape part of the South. But anyway, um, we do cover the Neponset watershed, um, uh, just a little bit of the top of the top, with like communities that are on the watershed divide, like Stoke, I think, uh, and Ten Mile, and that sort of thing. And then we cover the South Shore communities as far south as Duxbury. Uh, and that's the MATC region. This part of the world we extend around to the North Shore as far as Ipswich as well, to the western suburbs along the 495 Beltway, I'll be like talking. Um, and I'm director of the environmental program, which includes water resources management. And one of our big efforts these days, actually I'll mention two of them. One of them is storm water. We've been working in fact with the in the Ponce Watershed Group on a project over the last year or so, the 10 towns in that uh, watershed. And we're doing some work in regional climate change uh, and getting started with a local project in the city of Quincy. So that's a few uh, examples of things that we're working on. Yeah. And I'm not sure if this goes any further down. Oh, yes. oh. Right, well, I'm Debbie Cook. I work for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, and I am manager of the Greenscapes program. And for those of you who don't know, the Greenscapes program started at the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. It's in 11 towns on the South Shore. It's in 19 towns on the North Shore. It's out in Pioneer Valley. And uh, it started um, about 12 years ago as um, sort of a response to uh, water quantity issues because we were finding that water consumption was doubling every summer uh, due to lawn irrigation. So we started focusing on you know, lawn care relating to water, water uh, quantity. But as time has gone on, water quality has become a bigger and bigger issue. And so we focus a lot now on storm water. And, uh, so we, we do a whole number of things to educate people um, from press releases and events and things like that. And about six years ago, we started a uh, school program, which probably is our signature program. Um, to date, we have done 18,000 children in our school program uh, just on the South Shore. The program's uh, expanded to the North Shore, and we're very excited about this. Um, and uh, basically, my issues, my interest has, all, has been for a long time in water quality and lawn care and things like that. I was a conservation commissioner for 15 years. And I'm going to sort of get into some of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, a little bit about stormwater, but not necessarily relating to the MS4, about some things that just have really, I think we could make some changes with our lawn care and permitting and things like that. So I'll get to that later. Hi, I'm Newton Tedder. I'm the MS4 permit writer. We one the MS4 stands for the Municipal Septic Storm Sewer. Um, we released a permit this year. It's a new permit. Um, it's going to replace the one that was done in 2003. Um, the comment period closed at the end of February for that permit. We got about 1,700 pages of comments. Um, as you can imagine, it was a, just a very big love fest, and everybody loved it. <laughs> so I'll be able to get into more of that. <laughs> we, we only have love here. <laughs> All right, so now that I've rewound us back to the introductions, why don't we, we jump back to the first question. So, so what, um, from each of your unique perspectives, what are some of the things that um, you think are some of the important sleeper issues in stormwater management? that maybe people aren't paying as much attention okay, to thank as they you. Well, you know, this is a permit that is so well examined and trodden over sort of 1,500 pages that it's hard to imagine there's anything that's a sleeper in here. It's somewhat <laughs> some of but it really depends on your perspective. I would argue that there's, there's, at least from my perspective, two kinds of sleeper. One of them is so obvious it's, it's hidden in plain sight, and the other is so obscure that it's probably not even mentioned in the permit but has a major impact. The one that's so obvious that it's hidden in plain sight is the public education and public participation piece. There's an awful lot of focus on all of the technical requirements, as there needs to be. 
permit, everything to do with, uh, you know, you're disconnecting the illicit discharges, doing lots of testing, monitoring, mapping, all of that needs to be done, and needs to be done better than it's done. That's no question about that. There is one of the six major requirements, something in there about public education and public participation. But I guess I would argue that that's, that's something that is still kind of thought of by the folks who take on this permitting work is something an add-on, something that's just, yeah, we kind of have to do that. It's one of those requirements. Um, and I would back up and look at this from a bigger picture perspective. We're talking about changing the way society as a whole works at the way we manage our stormwater. I think it needs a shift in consciousness and awareness, not unlike what we had with recycling 20 or so years ago and smoking. Those, those changes didn't come easily, but they did come. But they came with a much bigger effort. And to put a, a kind of an add-on requirement on a local public works department, which is where this often comes to go out there and educate the public and get them behind this. I mean, I think we need to rethink how this is done. For one thing, it's the same message for the most part everywhere in most communities. And we, yet we have you know, efforts that are redundant or trying to reinvent the wheel in lots of smaller communities because of the nature of our own rule system, having all of these local permits, we don't even have counties to aggregate these things together for the most part. So I guess I would argue that we need to think about approaching this public education and, and for a broader spectrum of folks, especially folks like who are gathered here today, to think about how we can get together and make this a larger, higher scale effort maybe bring some more resources to bear on it than what communities would ever be able to get out of their local uh, coffers. When they're struggling to pay for all those technical requirements, they're probably just going to kind of do the minimum that's required to them uh, in the education program, which is just not going to do the job. But, you know, we know what's been done over the last few years. They, they do, for the most part, what they're supposed to do, but that means printing some brochures, maybe having an event at the town hall or something. That's, that's fine, but it doesn't rise to the occasion that we need to change awareness about this issue. Since we know non-point source pollution traces all the way back to every single piece of property, every single single homeowner, business owner. They all have to be aware of what this, why it's even a problem. You can't get people willing to pay for a problem before they even understand that it's a problem. And that's the other thing. Those of us who have worked, this is, I mean, we're preaching to the choir sort of. It's a very nice choir, by the way. It sounds good. Uh, but, you know, we have often get frustrated. Why, why don't people understand? Well, you know, they never were never taught about stormwater. And stormwater, as we talked about, you mentioned at the outset here, wastewater, drinking water, stormwater, the three sort of major kinds of water infrastructure. Of those three, stormwater is the kind of orphaned infrastructure. It's never been even thought of as a, as a unified system. It doesn't have a, 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 an organizational and institutional structure around it the way you do with water supply and wastewater where you have a user pay system. So that's the other thing that I will talk about later is, is, is a little bit about how you get into that issue of the house paid for. But right now, it's just something that is not really understood by the public. And until more people really understand it, we're not going to have the, the, we're not going to get the traction that we need in the communities. Um, that's the out in plain sight. So obviously, it's out in plain sight sleep that I think we need to pay more attention to it and do, do so regionally, statewide, regionalwide, New Englandwide, whatever. Uh, the other one is the one that's so obscure, it's probably not even mentioned, but it's the wor two words, land use. And it, this gets not to what's coming out the end of the pipe and how do you control all of that, but how do we do work to prevent things from getting in the pipe to begin with and with better land use practice? Eric just mentioned a few examples of this with green infrastructure, uh, with transferable development rights. There's, there are tools out there, but again, until we focus and put the best tools forward in our communities. And again, this is a challenge that falls because of our home rule system, town by town, city by city. This is not something the state, even if they want to do, sort of, you know, pass a regulation or, or wait a magic wand and solve the problem. Land use is a local responsibility. And so we need to have better, better forms of looking at how we get away from these sprawling patterns into more compact development and building infrastructure into that as a normal way of doing business, not as some kind of, excuse me, some exotic sort of add-on that, that I think some people still think that, you know, the green infrastructure, low impact development, that's a nice little add. It has to be baked into how we, we, we do our land use and our development. So those are my two steps. Okay, um, I'm gonna go I agree um, very much about the education part since that, obviously that is what we are trying to do um, is the public education and, um, 
and we basically have found that you know that there's certainly economies of scale that the EPA and people appreciate um, and can save the towns a lot of money is you know using organizations like ours on a regional level to make to make things that we all share. You know, these are these are some brochures that we made on stormwater, and this is about impervious surfaces and things like that. Um, that we can, you know, that our member communities can use, which is which is a really worthwhile thing. But one of the things when you ask about sleeper issues that I wanted to touch on that isn't in the MS4 and it's something totally outside, but it's something that's really, really troubled me as a conservation commissioner and as somebody who's in the community, and that is I feel that a lot of people who are in the business of taking people care of people's properties are not properly licensed. And I feel like um, that, that uh, the towns and maybe regional organizations could um, press for that. I feel, we used to call them the mow and blow guys, but these guys are out there putting fertilizer on in July and August. I mean, and, and we know that 80% of what they put on their property runs off. I mean, it's a huge issue. And, and homeowners obviously need to be educated too, but the, the low-hanging fruit is to get to these guys because I don't know about you, but in my community, hardly anyone's doing their own lawn care anymore. And, and I feel like we really need to license them and make them have an organic track and understand, you know, um, basically not just how the pesticides and herbicides and everything work, but basically you know, how they travel and, and how, you know, and how it all works together. And, you know, not the good times to put, put this stuff down. They don't learn that. Um, and I feel like they should have a mandatory organic track or some sort of land care track. Um, so if that's what I feel very strongly about. Thank you. Come back to the permit a little bit because that's where I spent my entire life. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any sleepers in there. I've read it many, many times. I think it's fine. <laughs> in reality, I think uh, design is the biggest sleeper. That's in the, that's baked into the permit in, in certain ways, um, but not necessarily ever talked about. And when I talk about design, I'm talking about like design of BMPs, design of green infrastructure BMPs, being more specific. So as we like, learn more about stormwater and we study it more, and it's really like a pledge from science at this point where we learn more and more almost every day with different practitioners out there, different scientists researching. Um, the, the, the first flush phenomenon is a is somewhere where we can take, we should be taking full advantage of when we're, when we're in our design of BMPs. Um, traditional design is you take, you're looking for the biggest piece of land that you possibly can to fill it with the biggest BMP possible. So you're treating this, you know, 1.2 inch rainstorm, um, and that's your water quality volume that you're treating. And you're making a massive, massive BMP that costs a lot of money and trying to put as much money area into as possible. But I think once we once you start to look at first flush um, and start to design around that, you, you realize that you're getting the most bang for your buck when you're only really treating between 0.3 and 0.4 inches. Um, those big systems, those expensive systems, do not provide um, the payback for what you're putting in. And you get the most pollutant removal at, the, at the, those really low end. So if you were to then take that sort of particular mindset and, and kind of spread it out over your watershed and say, instead of doing two large BMPs, I'm going to do a bunch of tiny ones. I'm going to spread it out over the course of my watershed and just get what I can when I can. Maybe I'll design a 0.1 inch system at, um, as a curb cut and a 0.3 inch system across the street instead of one big system at the end. And you're going to spend less money and your design is going to have to change. Your LID practices are going to have to be in place and you're going to have to have different uh, ordinances in town to allow for it. But it's also a money saving activity as well. So it's more environmental benefit um, for cheaper. But it takes um, the engineers to sort of re-educate themselves and rethink about how they deal with planning green infrastructure on a watershed scale. Great. Do we want to take a second? Does anybody from the audience want to nominate a sleeper issue? <laughs> all right. Hearing none, apparently we understand all the issues. Um, 
So my next question is, uh, you know, clearly uh, the MS4 permit is going to raise the bar for what's expected of communities in terms of stormwater management. And I wonder if um, our panelists have any suggestions for strategies communities might consider to, um, to help make uh, their compliance with the permit as simple and as effective as possible. Maybe we'll follow this in order. Sure. Um, on this one, I think one of the important things, and, and again, it back, it's back to basics, is coordination and communication within the community. Um, the, the stormwater permit is a multifaceted permit. On the face of it, you might think, oh, this is just a water issue and it's just going to be the public works, you have to deal with it. Well, they'll deal with a lot of the issues, but there are many other issues dealing with the land use, the, the, the bylaws, the plans, the involved, we need to have conservation commissions. I would argue that boards of health and Canada should have a role. <coughs> when we talk about the education, maybe the schools. So I really think, and I think maybe a few communities have done this, but most have not. They need to kind of pull together an interdisciplinary uh, working group. And now I'm not saying that you want to form necessarily a new, you know, permanent, uh, you know, institutional body that's it's, it's the stormwater committee. Uh, but I do think you need to have a coordinating mechanism, even if you kind of keep it informal, where you have a, an opportunity for these different aspects of town government. And they even bring in outside of government itself, groups like watershed groups and, and maybe a local school or university or whoever may have uh, some resources or something to add to that in, in that particular community. Um, we, we really need to understand the multidisciplinary nature of this issue and to get at the different strands and to pull, pull, pull this apart and understand where the sources come from and how the different kinds of controls can work. Uh, it really has to be beyond just the kit of the one department that you usually get to, which is public works or highway department, et cetera. Um, and so I think there's just needs to be an understanding at a higher level within the town, the town administration that they need to focus on this and bring together folks who can bring different perspectives and different resources and tools to bear on the problem. Once again, I will, you know, say that um, that I think what we bring to the table as sort of a, a regional agency is um, is economies of scale, and there's a lot of things that we can do, the education and outreach. That frankly, a lot of the um, consultants in these in the towns for the MS4 permit have told us they don't really want to do them anyway, and uh, and the thing is about organizations like a watershed organization is. We um, can marshal um, volunteers, you know, and we um, can organize outreach activities. And, uh, and, and frankly, we, we get interns in the summer that we can dispatch to different towns to actually make, not just a, not so that the education is all vanilla, but that we're doing things that are specific to those towns uh, with, you know, with resources that the towns themselves would probably not have the coordination um, and ability to marshal. So um, so I think that, that that's the thing is for towns to be able to look at, at their local, their regional organizations, um, and especially things like Watershed. I mean, on the North Shore, it's, it's uh, Salem State, uh, Salem Sound Coast Watch and Merrimack Valley um, Planning uh, Commission. And, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. So it's not just watershed groups; it's planning groups and things like that um, that are that are in this coalition. And you know, when we all share materials, and um, and then we develop new materials. The North Shore just developed a great, you know, um, pet waste uh, product that we're all going to use. So um, so the towns don't necessarily have to be like. Know, overwhelmed by the outreach and um, education requirements if they just look a little bit beyond their borders. I guess I'd just like to add that the, the regulations specifically call out that any permittee can use other organizations to meet those permit requirements. So it's really specifically wanting uh, coordination, such as through watershed groups or through uh, stormwater coalitions to try to meet some of the permit together. Um, so it's cheaper for each individual currency. Um, beyond that, I'm going to throw out everybody's favorite word, which is uh, utility. Um, we, we in New England, um, 
just really don't happen. If you look at a map of stormwater utilities where they actually treat stormwater as something that needs dedicated funding um, to actually meet water quality, get water quality benefits. And you look at the map of the country and they're everywhere, except for New England. Um, we are very far behind in that regard. Um, that has a lot to do with our government set up, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, it does take just what Mark is talking about, a change in attitude, but it also takes some willingness at the local government level to set it up. But having a dedicated funding source to, to deal with the, the biggest water quality problem we have in Massachusetts, um, I, I think it's not, it doesn't need to be necessary, but I think it would help a lot of towns if that were the case. Um, that takes a lot of planning. That planning may need to start now. Um, it's, we are very far behind the rest of the country in, in treating stormwater as both a resource and in certain areas of waste. Like that here too, because that's what it is. It's a resource first and a waste in some instances. And in order, if we don't put the burden on the people that are actually creating the pollution, which are those, which it is the development, then what we're doing is really subsidizing development through environmental degradation. And uh, that kind of needs to be stopped. Excellent. Um, I like your last point. We've, we've tried to make that last point to a number of our communities that, that basically, if, if you don't, in the context of bylaws, that if communities don't step up and adopt strong, thoughtful bylaws, that essentially they're taking ownership of the pollution they're allowed to be created, which is ultimately not good for you. Um, all right, so over uh, the various debates around the MS4 permit, there have been um, many different, very widely varying estimates of how much this is going to cost communities from, you know, oh, don't worry about it, it'll be nothing to, you know, incredibly, you know, the horror story kinds of estimates that seem designed to break <laughs> um, And I guess I'd throw out to the group, how, how difficult of a change do we think this is going to be for, communi for communities? You know, how big of a change from their current operations really is this? And do folks have any ideas for, um, creative ways to help communities uh, manage those costs and, and fund those new activities. Okay. Uh, I guess I, I've looked at a number of studies and been out there to try to estimate the costs and, and have to put the caveat that some of them were done in different contexts. For instance, the studies that were done for the three communities in the Upper Charles, which were facing a residual designation uh, there was going to be a very different set of requirements and a more robust set of requirements there than you would see across the board for the other communities that have just the standard MS4 permit. But nonetheless, uh, in communities with an MS4 permit that also have TMDL requirements, that's, that's going to raise the bar for them uh, to make it maybe a little bit closer to that. Uh, so there's not any one right answer for how expensive it's going to be. There, there's going to be some variability. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be much more expensive than it has been in the past. There's no question about that. I can't put a number or a percentage on it across the board. I even have to look at some studies. But I guess I would just say that qualitatively, it's going to be expensive enough that business as usual will not do the job. Uh, just saying, okay, our public works budget has to increase 10% or 40% or whatever, so whatever it might be. Uh, out of the general world, but in mean, most communities, that's a that's not going to be enough to do the job. And even if they could get that large of an increase through town through normal general revenues, I mean, it would be very tough votes to take in town meeting and all of that. Um, so I come back to what we just talked about with the stormwater utilities. Although I think I would just modify that a little bit and say that um, some kind of a stormwater fee system it does not have to be literally a utility. That's one particular kind of structure. And it could work for some communities. It works in many places around the rest of the country, but most of those places are county-based and that sort of thing, or regional. Uh, but some kind of a fee system uh, where basically you are putting the costs on to both the user, the user being the, the, the properties that the, the pervious services that generate the, the, the stormwater in the first place. Uh, putting that in place in combination with a robust credit system that lets people have uh, a credit for when they do uh, treat, treat the stormwater or reduce the stormwater through green infrastructure through LID techniques, whether that's on the system now or whether that's something they add later, I think starts to create the push and pull and sort of the market signals of this is, 
this is a resource that needs to be dealt with, but if, then if you do the right thing and reduce the burden on the watershed, the burden on the town by what you're doing in your property, you will also see that reflected in, in, a, in a significantly lower fee. Uh, so it really is a question that we need to, to think about how uh, this gets on a somewhat equal footing to the other two uh, sister infrastructure systems and water supply and wastewater uh, through some kind of a fee, whether or not that's a utility. Mm -hmm. I agree that the infrastructure is going to cost um, well, probably uh, a fair amount. Um, but the education and outreach back again, um, we've been on the um, Greenscapes Coalition um, trying to prepare for umpteen years for the MS4 permit. And for those of you who don't know, you know, they have a very prescribed list of sort of target audiences and a prescribed way of re reaching those audiences. And so we geared up with plans on a regional basis to, to deal with this, and it's not cost prohibitive. And already the towns are paying us, you know, as I said, this program's been around for 12 years, so it's not gonna be a big leap um, as far as some of the education. I'm not saying we can provide maybe all of the education that a town might desire, but we certainly can provide quite a bit, and we're gearing up for it. And each year we say, "Is this the year? Is this going to? Is this? Is it going to happen this year?" And, um, so anyway, you, you don't realize that we're all we're all just ready. And the first group we're going to go for is residential and and um, pet waste, if you, if you want to know. So that's what we're we're talking about. Um, and um, so, it's, so the other thing, there's another component is the outreach, and that is obviously a lot more town specific. That will um, obviously add some more cost, you know, to the towns. But once again, um, I think I was saying that I think that you know there's still with the resources that we have, we can you know get some some um, support and and customize plans for towns at, you know, at far cheaper rate than the consultant would. So. Okay, so I think fees and utilities we've covered it pretty much ad nauseum. But um, when you're talking about cost of the permit, there's a, a whole lot of numbers out there. And I think what I usually do when I get the comment um, contains a number, I look at it's from, it's from Ian, I multiply it by two, when it's from uh, and from the town, I divide by two. It comes pretty close to you know where I think we should probably be. Um, so stormwater is just one of those things that towns have to pay for. We're going to be talking about the two other like, uh, streams, drinking water and wastewater uh, later. But there's a really big deficit across the state for infrastructure on all three of those. Um, so and this was just a was passed not too long ago. The Massachusetts legislature passed a general law allowing a 3% uh, basically tax on, on the general tax base that doesn't go against property of the And this is specifically to target um, those three streams drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater, um, and the, the aging infrastructure problem that we have across the state. Now, it's not, you know, it's not the only solution, but it's just another tool that towns could, could use besides the utility and besides the fee. It doesn't actually hamper them with problems with that. Um, that's that's my point. Yeah, we don't want to that's a good one. I've never heard that before. Um, all right, and I think we're getting close to the end. So rather than asking my last question, I think I want to open it up to the audience in case anybody has questions. In the back, Heidi. Uh, Heidi Ritchie, Mass Audubon. I I agree with everything the panelists have said. I think it provide a lot of good insights. Uh, but I just wanted to, to pick up on it, you know, this issue of land use and cost and a more multidisciplinary approach. I, I think that we really need to look beyond just the cost of compliance and help communities with education better understand the, the true cost of businesses as usual, which includes some of the things Eric was talking about, increased vulnerability to flooding, um, you know, also saying increased recharge or water supplies, those kinds of costs, small costs of more and more roads to maintain, those kinds of things, and and multidisciplinary, something that I rarely hear people talk about is that 
our traditional storm water, we're putting everything into one big basin and the catch basins into one big basin. Those systems breed mosquitoes, and everybody's worried about mosquito-borne disease due to the climate change. That's something the public cares about, even though the risk is tiny. They do care about that, and they pay for um, you know our siding of all these uh, traditional stormwater systems. We can show them there's a different way to do development that's cost-effective and that avoids those kinds of problems. Yeah. We, somehow we need to motivate the public. We're just telling them they need to take the path is going to do it. We have to find other things that are going to show them that avoided costs of doing things like that. Paul? Yeah, it seems to me there's two ways to pay for stormwater. There uh, taxes or either taxes or water bills. And I'm just hopeful that as events unfold that at least some portion of the cost of stormwater utilities, once they're set up, can be uh, funded through surcharges on water usage rates uh, because it would be an incentive uh, or add to the incentive to conserve. Water bill is usually one of your smallest utility bills. It's always been, uh, you know, not we don't pay the full cost of water. So I like to see some of the cost of stormwater uh, utilities added on to uh, the water bill. Can I just re reframe Paul's statement as a question for the audience? Is, is there a precedent or even the legal possibility of doing that to essentially raise water rates to pay for stormwater? I don't know the precedent. I do think that it would be subject to challenge that there's not a nexus between how much drinking water you bring into a property compared to how much stormwater you generate. And that's why most of the stormwater fee systems are tied to the amount of impervious surface, surface on the property. Other questions? Um, not, not necessarily a question, but um, I'm not sure if you know. The Irrigation Association in New England is actually sponsoring legislation to create a certification program for themselves. So uh, I can get that bill number to you, but I'm sure they would welcome your support on trying to, to get the, the contractor registration system through. Um, we're kind of a unique town in Westport where our MS4 area is very small and uh, nobody lives below it, basically. Um, so you're talking about fee, fees and this is for wastewater as well. We have septic and we have water 99% of the town. Um, does the state recognize the uniqueness of our uh, dilemma of not only dealing with stormwater, which is not our biggest problem, um, in fact, it's, it's relatively minor. We have our TMDL coming out, which we're going to have to deal with. Um, which is a septic is issue. Um, and there's no financial infrastructure to raise the money other than a tax on land. Is, is that something that's recognized? Um, I don't know how many other towns have this issue, but we're kind of stuck in a, a no man's land with this. Um, is there any, any way you can help us with this? Uh, I'm, not, I guess I'm not really sure what the question is, but I'll try to see if I can figure it out. Um, so, you, are you on the Cape? So we Westport. Westport. Um, okay, so go, towns without um, traditional um, infrastructure for stormwater, um, you do not have traditional pipes, you may have pipes to catch basins in certain areas. Um, but your MS4 also includes all your roads and impervious services, so it's not just you know, traditional pipe system. And without um, a sewer system where with potential cross connections and with increase of elicits within a convoy of uh, traditional sewer system, your requirements under the permit just become a lot easier. Um, you're, you're, you're not doing as much as that town with the sewer system. You're not dealing with the elicits the way that the other town's dealing with them. Um, if you have mostly groundwater recharge and don't really have any outfalls, your requirements um, for IDP in particular are going to be vastly, vastly easier than your neighbor. So while it's more, we don't carve out something for people without uh, sewer, traditional sewers, um, the requirements are scalable, and they are scaled based on how complex your system is. So. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Could I just put in a plug? Sure. For my new book? I know. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, I just want to mention, talking about stormwater financing, uh, MAPC has just put 
together this year a, uh, a start one called the Stormwater Financing Starter Kit, which is kind of a tool toolkit. Uh, and I didn't, in the interest of saving paper, I didn't bring copies of it, but I can give a web, uh, a web address for it. I'll have it up here, but I'll say quickly, it's on our site, matc.org slash stormwater underscore financing. And I'll have this up here for anyone who wants to, uh, to download it to see what, how, how that might work out in your town. We actually have taken this starter kit out for a little bit of a test drive in this regional project we've been working with. Uh, in, in the Neponsa watershed over the last few months, uh, doing some of the initial uh, uh, touch, touching base with communities, getting them uh, thinking about it and running some of the initial numbers in the towns of Milton and Devon. And actually, Milton looks like they're interested in going on some of the next steps. Uh, so we'll see. I think it's going to be a slow process, but I do think that as the reality of, this, of the MS4 and the general better management comes more into focus, you'll see more communities begin to probably reluctantly realize that. They're not going to be able to do it on the tax base and they'll need to think about something like this. So hopefully this tool this toolkit will be helpful helpful to communities. It's not just for the MAPC, anyone in Massachusetts. Quick question in the front row. Yes, Jeff. Yes, I guess the question that I had was um, I think this is somewhat already taken care of, but is the the maintenance of things is often the problem. And um, you know, we put in green infrastructure, we put in rain gardens, and then we see them not being maintained. Um, and watershed associations really don't have that ability either. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand that that's, that's part of the issue is this, you know, we can build green infrastructure, but it doesn't go away uh, anymore as if you put it in the ground and forgot about it. So I don't really want to. The question is, is about, let's make sure we get some funding in place to keep, keep that on the table. One, one observation I'd make is part of this regional project we did was to look at, um, at least for privately owned infrastructure, to try to create a framework for digitizing the whole process of on end plans, and reporting on on end plans, and enforcement of on end plans. Now all we need is about $150,000 to actually make it into a tool that everybody can stick to. So if anybody has a checkbook, just <laughs> we have an RFP already, right? Right. And I think there's a question in the back. Yeah, could you just um, repeat, just repeat the website? Sure. www.mapc.org/stormwater-financing, and I'll be glad to share with the folks after the session. I think we have th three. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, this is an add-on. Just a quick add-on question for Martin. Um, since you made, I think, a really compelling case for the importance of some kind of unified public communication around this, I was just wondering if the toolkit included any resources or models that you might have seen from communities, or if you know of any that from your other service areas or around the state or region where communities have done an effective job on that? It, it does refer to a few places where this has been done, um, but quite frankly, we're, we're breaking new ground here and trying to do a more, you know, a better job and a more comprehensive and a broader job than the town by town. So there, there are a few examples of what's, what's could be, what could go into a program like that, but it's not in and of itself. I think that might be our next toolkit, is to focus on that section and bring that out in more, uh, more robustly. Great, and I was just gonna, call, I think we have two minutes left, and I was just gonna pose my last question, which are there any um, sort of resources or reference materials or other things that you guys think are particularly useful that you would like to plug? Well, you've got mine already. Uh, we, got, we got Mark's already. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, basically, if, if anyone's interested, you know, these materials are all on our Greenscapes website. Um, we can download them as a PDF. On the EPA Stormwater website, we have links to uh, what's called like the Stormwater Education Toolbox, where you can search for different educational materials based on pollution concern or based on uh, target audience look at what's out there across the country, um, Donald will be using for anybody to use them. Um, as well as different um, different things that he is putting out as far as tools are concerned. So like in December, we're, we're going to roll out a tool that looks at um, optimizing the placement of green infrastructure based on size and differences and pollution removal based on size in your watershed. 
it's going to be a pretty robust tool um, using our climate um, and using our uh, wood rule for different green infrastructure communities and trying to figure out how we would plan a watershed restoration in the most optimal way. So we're, we're trying to roll out some tools, but on that our stormwater website, I think the Adrian one has just got all those all that stuff. Excellent. Do you want to mention the stormwater? Sure. If, if folks are interested, we did in this regional project that we just finished with MAPC. There is a, a website associated with that as well, which is um, NepotsitStormWater.org, and there's various things there. There's some some model. We actually one of the things we did was um, we put together a model um, uh, SWIP chapter for public outreach and public participation that folks could look at as they're starting to write their this. Materials. Yeah, as well as a lot of good educational materials that folks are welcome to take advantage of. Um, there's also materials on there. We, you know, at APC, developed a process to um, to try to delineate uh, your catchments for each um, outfall, which is an important part of the IDDE process and something which none of our communities have dealt with. So they've created a tool to help you do that. So there's a variety of useful tools there as well. So thank you very much.